Okay, now we're going to talk about building better court systems. Uh, we got a complex system. We need constant attention. And I've been doing this. I started the court improvement in my court in the 80s. In the 80s. And it's still going full tilt. So this is not a job that goes away after a couple of years. This is a indefinite period. It's an attitude towards the court system and the work that we do, the importance of it, and how we can improve every day if we talk about it and we do problem solving. That's the one I hear the most. We've always been doing it this way in such and such a county. And I say, OK, it's worked up to now. Do you think it might work better if you tweaked it? And that's why court improvement is about an attitude. It's about saying, you know something, I'm not going to assume that we're doing it the best way. And I will tell you, I've never been into a court, ever, any place, that's doing it the right way in every aspect. Some courts do a lot of good things, and they do some things that aren't very smart. And so the attitude is, I'm going to look around, and I'm going to pick out, I'm going to go cherry picking. I'm going to pick the best things from the different courts that I see around the country and implement them in my own court. And that's what model courts are all about. And guess what it takes? It takes judicial leadership. If the judge is not at the head of the line, the rest of the system will say, well, the judge doesn't think this is important, and therefore we don't have to. But in the juvenile court, we are goal-oriented. We have a purpose. We have statutes that tell us best interest of the child, reunification, all these different things we have to do. And in order to do that, it takes more than just what goes on in the courtroom. So what do you need for this? You need long judicial assignments to, to um, juvenile court. I understand that's an issue in, in Washington. It's nothing compared to what it is in California. We used to have the six-month rotation, the, the one-year rotation. And that's why California juvenile courts are weak, weaker than they should be. Probably the most important thing that I was at, had an impact on was persuading the Los Angeles presiding judge to keep a particular judge in that place who's now been there for 12 years and probably is the most important judge in the country because he's got the largest juvenile court in the country. And you need continuity. You need to have institutional memory. And leaders have institutional memory. You need to have regular administrative meetings convened by the judge. You need regular cross-trainings, and you need to borrow best practices. A purpose. Where are we going? What's our purpose? And we collaborate. We collaborate with everybody in sight, because everybody has an impact on what we're doing. OK, now we're going to talk about family drug treatment courts. I know you have them, but I thought you'd like to see a little bit about another one. One, I started this one about 11 years ago. It was one of, one of the first five or six in the country. And um, we're going to show it right now. You came into this court and you weren't sure of yourself. You were, you were lost, as far as I could tell. Yes. Yeah, you were. And through this last year, you put your life together. You built your life, and the best reflection of it is, for a person who came in and didn't smile for about the first three or four months, you have <laughs> such a pretty smile, and we see it all the time. And it's a sign of how happy you are in yourself and how happy you are with what's happened in your life. And so I'm just, I'm just really proud of you, so congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Dependency Drug Court is an intensive effort by the juvenile court and all of its participants in the context of child welfare proceedings to provide intensive services for substance abusing parents so that they can get their rehabilitation fixed early and get their children back sooner. Um, I got pulled over and um, my little girl was with me and I had drugs on me. Um, and they took her, I don't think they realized Actually, the policeman told me that I would be able to see her, go get her out of the shelter. Um, that's not the way it works. When clients first come to dependency, uh, they are often distraught and angry and vulnerable and 
very upset at the system and probably at themselves and are at rock bottom. Do you realize that, um, that if you join this, become a member of the um, Drug Treatment Court, that that doesn't guarantee anything? It just means that you are going to be working harder with this team on your recovery. Okay, it doesn't mean that you're ne necessarily going to have the children uh, return to you, although it, in my opinion, maximizes your chances. It also means that terrible things might happen. I mean, you could, if you don't follow the plan, you could get thrown out of the program. We actually had somebody go to jail once. But having all those things in mind, you still like to join this, this court. Yes, sir. You know what the ground rules are? Let me tell you what they are. We will expect you to accept and participate in the treatment plan that we have determined for you. And so we didn't know when we started that we would have to have somebody in the domestic violence community sitting in our court. We didn't know we would have to have a mental health person in our court. We didn't know that we would have to have a housing expert on our team or a public health nurse on our team. We learned all these and more because the client would come in and say, you know I'm clean and sober, but I don't have a place to live. Or you know I'm clean and sober, but my boyfriend keeps beating me up. And we learned from this that we have to take a holistic approach to the recovery for our clients. And the big difference is that we'll be seeing you regularly to monitor how you're doing. Okay. Secondly, we expect you to go to AANA meetings. What is your current pattern for going to those meetings? I go just about every day. Just about every day. Well, we'll set the bar at four a week. Okay? okay? But if you want to go more, it'll make Miss Cushion so happy. She'll <laughs> be so, she'll brag about you. I think the drug court works um, mainly because um, each individual client has a individual treatment plan. And that treatment plan is pretty comprehensive in that it takes into account um, what services are going to meet the requirements for their dependency case as well as what services are going to be required for them to actually rehabilitate themselves. Who's speaking on behalf of Christine? I am. All right. Okay. Um, this is, let's see, this is a 36-year-old woman who's got a 14-year-old, a 10-year-old, and a 7-year-old, and jurisdiction was just on uh, the 5th of this month. Um, the building blocks for this court are a dedicated judge, a judge who wants to do something better for the clients who are in his or her court, who will organize and convene the court system and bring on board the substance abuse treatment community, which is the necessary first step for an effective dependency treatment court. And what I think we, we've been finding in Santa Clara County with the drug court uh, demonstration in, in Len Edwards Court is that where the participation is within the same setting as the larger process of family reunification, that the incentives to participate and the, the stick with itness on the part of participants really increases. I think it's very clear that having a drug court creates the atmosphere where people work together and people working together around helping a mom and people working together with more services I think definitely helps the kids. What's very clear is children who are removed from their homes really don't do very well. We don't have a lot of good answers. You know, we have group homes and foster care and things like that. They are not very adequate alternatives to a family. So to the extent you can help strengthen the family unit, that's always the better alternative. And I think that's the main outcome. Hi, Marissa. <laughs> she's teething. She's got four teeth. She doesn't feel good today. Here at House on the Hill, we offer our clients uh, parenting classes. Um, we have life skills classes. We have uh, relapse prevention. Uh, there's a class where they just learn about alcohol and drugs and the effects it has on them and the family. We also have a family group and an aftercare group. And um, 
course, we also do testing, which um, UA testing, which is uh, required by CPS and the judge. Um, and also, while they're living here, they learn just everyday things, how to cook, uh, how to clean, just be moms. For me, as a, a social worker, it validates what I do. It's not just a case manager. That is more than just opening the case and going through the case plan and walking through the case plan. You are rebuilding and helping to rebuild families. And I don't think as a social worker you could get any better than that, especially a social worker in child welfare, because we are we have the reputation of removing children. That's what we do. We have the reputation of removing children, putting them in foster care, or splitting up families. And here we are in drug court, helping to reunite and rebuild families. And when I started testing five days a week, I really began, began to get serious about my recovery. And, um, you know, Judge Edwards, like I said, he, he gave me so many chances because my tests kept coming up dirty, and um, he kept just kept giving me chances. And when I when I found that that you know he had my back and my my lawyer my my lawyer had my back too. I mean, everybody seen something in me that I I just never thought that I could stay clean and sober. And that that led me to start going to my meetings, getting a sponsor, um, doing the right thing. And um, here's my son. <laughs> you know, I got my son. Well, I have just signed the papers. You are officially in the drug court. Congratulations. Thank you. We look. Uh, we have a lot of success around here, and we expect you to be one of those people who is successful in her recovery and in all aspects of this. They're held accountable. They're told they have to be responsible. But rather than pointing out their failures or what they have to do, every little step they take, every little movement they make, they get full credit for the work that they've done, and it's reinforced. That's really the key to change. Whatever the issue is, that's the key to change. It's not doing more of the same, which is the power and control. It's coming from a place that gives them the power, gives them the sense of accomplishment, and reinforces their movement forward. Linda, ever since I, I met you, I thought you were a bright spot and was always excited to see your name on the calendar. And I think you've been um, an inspiration to the other drug court participants and certainly have been an inspiration to your family. And I'm very happy for you. Thank you. Anyone else like to say anything? I just want to thank everyone for all your support and I'm really grateful for that. And I'm just going to stay clean and sober from now on. That's thank wonderful. You. I have no question that we have reunified children with mothers that would not have been able to get their children back because of drug treatment court. Absolutely. So then it forces you to go out and get the services that not that not only benefit the the hundred or so women or men that are in your dependency drug court, but then all the other hundreds of women and men that aren't because you now have services for them all. Kids don't need to wait. Kids need to get to their home, their permanent home, as soon as possible. This kind of a program, this drug court, gets that decision made sooner than anything else we've done. Never ceases to amaze me what my clients have overcome and the histories they've had um, and where they are um, by the time they've really engaged in the process and, and graduated, and it's really an amazing thing. And um, it took me 15 months and I got my little girl back. And um, I got both of them back. And my older daughter told me, you know, Mom, it's, I don't think that program's about the moms getting their kids back, it's about the kids getting their moms back. And I was really happy to actually see her go through the program. And because it improved her a lot, because sometimes like she wouldn't go through programs in this program, she actually went through it and she graduated from it. And it was a really happy day for me and like the rest of our family, because my mom's clean now and and this program did stop her and it gave me a chance to get to know my mom a lot better. Ever since I was little, since like my mom has been like this, I don't know. I just kind of always wanted to be a lawyer. Now I kind of want to be a judge, work up to being a judge. I think it'd be cool.
Okay, I want to tell you three things about that, and then we'll take a couple of questions, and I have some more to talk about. The first thing is that that's the most inspirational work I've ever done as a judge. The changes I saw in the people, and there were men and women, but mostly women, 95%, were so dramatic I didn't believe it. Somebody would walk into court and I would say, there's no way that this is ever going to work out after I read this petition, saw the police reports, and saw everything. And then I would watch the transformation take place. Second thing is, we've been evaluated. Had a federal evaluator live in my court for five years. I've got the full report if you want it. They were out of Portland. If you want the report, the model that we use reworks. Okay? The third thing is, I hope you looked with envy and said, do you mean those women and those children have beds that are recovery beds, both intensive and transitional? Well, we don't have those in our community. How did that happen? And I'll tell you how it happened, because I expect you to be able to do something similar in your county. I went to the Board of Supervisors, and I sat down with them and the head of drug services, and I said, here's the budget for drug treatment services in our county. You will notice that almost all the money goes to men. And I want to tell you that I believe that the most important diet in our community are mother and children. And so how about dividing it up a little bit so that women and children have a substantial portion, not all, but fair share of drug treatment resources. I happen to be talking to a female member of the Board of Supervisors, <laughs> and she took charge. And we have a bunch of beds now, just a bunch of beds. And everybody realizes that this is the most cost-effective best intervention that we could make on behalf of our community. You got to think about your community as a whole. And your community as a whole is not necessarily providing most of your services for guys. I'll say no more about that. The last thing is, we are so happy about drug court that two things are happening. We've decided that everybody comes in the court is going to get this level of services. But we have a specialized court, and we just got a federal grant for this. for all positive toxicology babies born in our county. We figure it's about 200 a year. Alcohol, meth, whatever drug. That they are all going to be in an intensive infant's drug court with their moms and dads, if the dads are there, but sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. Our community is so excited about this that Everybody wants to be in the room. The consultant for this grant is Dr. Barry Brazelton. Huh? You know, NPR? This, you know about this? Huh? Eye contact, brain development, all that stuff. We got the, we got the master. And we are going to do this um, whether or not a petition is filed. And I was talking to the judge the judges yesterday about this. If the petition's not filed, they nevertheless are going to have voluntary service, so-called voluntary services, and they sign a contract, and part of that contract is to come to court and see the judge. Because I believe, and I think the, the evidence approve, uh, uh, demonstrates this, that there's something very powerful that happens when an authority figure pays attention to someone and cares about the result that that person is seeking in her or his life. And coming to see the judge with regular progress reports is the magic that I think drives the drug court. There are many other parts of it, but that's, that's the nub of it in, in my view. But of course I'm a judge, so I probably am prejudiced. And this is what the report said about our drug court. Treatment started faster, more treatment episodes, higher rate of reunification, get your children back sooner, children spend less time in foster care. I mean, yes, evaluation's another thing that you take 
to the legislature. As a result of this evaluation, both the federal government and the state of California are now funding drug courts because they know they work because the, they've evaluated it themselves. Okay, now we're going to talk about something else. Unless you want me to stop right now and somebody wants to ask a question about that. Yes. Just wondering if the report evaluated re-entry. Meaning families that were dismissed and relapsed. Well, we keep track of that. It's, uh, it's a small percentage, but there are some. And we think that's a very important part of the drug court environment that we're trying to create in our community. And there are several things that we do. The woman who started off uh, saying uh, she was driving, Barbara, um, is, was hired by the lawyers who represent parents. And she started what we call the Mentor Mom Program. So we have paid graduates who mentor the new people coming into the drug court. And when we went to the all sites meeting of model courts, we told about this, and it was immediately nominated as the most imaginative program, and every drug court adopted it overnight. Just I mean, why not? So the mentor becomes someone who is tied to the person after the dismissal. We're very concerned about what happens after dismissal. I was in my, I did a study in the drug courts in Miami, and Miami is cocaine center. And they have fabulous rehab facilities there. They have whole blocks of old motels they've taken over. But the problem with Miami is the relapse rate when they go back home. And so we really work on that. So there are two things that we do with the court. We have a Thanksgiving dinner every year, which gets bigger and bigger every year. Hundreds of people come. Free dinner. We get a service club to pay for it. To re-energize everybody. And we do the same with a summer picnic where we just want people to know that there are safe places in the community where they can come, clean and sober places, where we value the parenting relationship that you've demonstrated in your time in our drug court. We also have tried to develop groups, and you saw the Miller House group there, of the, all those women were in the drug court, but some of them had graduated, but they keep coming back to the group. And so to me, this is we all need to strategize on how we can build a clean and sober community by putting things in at different places that will support parents and their children to stay away from drugs. So what have we learned? The cases that come back we study very carefully and they include uh, isolation. The, the woman who becomes isolated, kids overwhelmed, gets depressed, and we had a couple of those that came back to us. And the other thing is the bad boyfriend returns with party time and everything goes downhill. So we spend a lot of time in drug court working on relationships. And that's a very tough issue. In order, in order to, the step one of the case plan is you're moving out from Mr. Mr. Violent. She says, but I love him. I say, fine. You want your kids back? This is, this is the step you have to take. That's very tough, tough stuff. Because she'll say, I don't want it. And we'll say, well, your chances of getting your kids back will probably be reduced because you, have, you, you continue to be victimized and you continue to use drugs with him. But choosing between your boyfriend and your child is one that is an eternal issue. And the drug court works very hard to get the mother to move in the correct direction. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, I'm, you know, with, with what you're saying, if you allocate optimal resources to a problem area, you're likely to have better outcomes. But in an era of diminishing resources, financial resources in particular, that there are many, many communities such as ours that are, that are looking at significant uh, financial shortfalls. I was wondering if you have any ideas of various strategies that communities like ours can use to ensure that these kind of critical services that we're looking for for families and children can take priority over other competing services. The, to summarize the question, how can a community that doesn't have the resources that I've talked about uh, do it? Okay, I'm going to say two things. First of all, you are wealthier than most communities I talk to. Okay. 
you are wealthier. I have communities that I talk to that have essentially two things, a visit to the court and AANA, both of which are essentially free, but they need transportation. That's what I call bare bones. But if you have that judge-client relationship and you have consistent attendance at AANA, you can do it. Okay, that's, that's the bare bones, and you got more than that. But secondly, I don't want you to be satisfied with what you have because I just gave you a little anecdote about how our community built resources based on taking a look at what you currently have and shuff, just move, not, not creating new resources, but modifying existing resources to reflect the needs of women and their children. Now remember, this, this country is essentially a male-driven country. That's the way we came in. And, and looking at our women with, with their own unique problems, women and babies have not been first and foremost in our, in our public systems in many communities. Well, I told you one way you might be able to do it. But there are other ways. How about some community partners? How about going to the hospitals, for example, who have an interest, a continuing interest in the health or the um, managed care hospital, and saying to them, how about you providing parenting classes for mothers and infants um, who happen to be drug exposed? In other words, you should look beyond what you currently have on your plate to other, other partners in the community who have an interest in your clients but have never realized that you have uniquely collected the most at-risk mothers and children in your community, in your court system. And so I would go into to a place and say, look, I can get you all the most at-risk people if you'll provide the class. So we have now classes, perinatal classes for moms and infants, <coughs> substance abusing moms. We have parenting classes that focus just on substance abusing parents and their children. And that can come from hospitals. And, and these, it comes from the YWCA. You want to give a project where the Y will, would, would embrace, try this one. So all that you're doing is you're shopping around to groups that haven't traditionally been involved in your child welfare system and saying to them, we have a need, can you help out? And it's a, it's a rare community. I've never found a community that hasn't wanted to help moms and new, newborns. So that, that's the best I can give you, okay? Okay, I'm going to keep going here. We've got group decision making. Uh, let me ask you that. Are you committed to keeping families, like children with their biological families? Raise your hand. Okay. There, Washington's one of 24 states with a relative preference statute. You know what that means? It means that you're supposed to prefer relatives over non-relatives when looking, when making placements. Okay? And now my question to you is, is that true in practice? It's written in the books. Is it true in practice? Wait till you hear some of my questions and you'll decide, okay? All right? So how late can a family member come on board and say, oh, I'm Uncle Charlie. And well, wait a minute, this child's been with uh, this family for a year and a half now, 18 months, 12 months. They're bonded. Can a relative come in and upset the apple cart? How late can a, a relative show up, a stranger relative? Or how late can grandmother change her mind and say, well, I told you I wouldn't adopt, but now I will, when the bonding's taking place? That's a tough question, isn't it? That's an eternal question. Well, here's, let's keep going on this one. This is, this is good stuff. So what efforts do you make to identify fathers? You make good efforts? You know, I find that the court has a very important role to play in this. Sometimes moms won't give up names and identifiers to the social worker. But there's, I've never had a mother who hasn't given them up to me. And I don't use brass knuckles. I just say, Mrs. Jones, you're in a court of law, and this is a very important decision, a very important fact that I have to have who is the father of this child. 
John, I don't know his last name. Where did he work? Where did you meet him? Did you ever meet his mother? Did you ever meet his brother? And that goes on. And the social worker, who hasn't been able to get a word out of mom, is scribbling down notes. And then after my examination, I say, Madam social worker, do the best you can to find this father. Even if mother considers him a bum, even if he's doing five to life in state prison, that makes no difference. You must find that father. That father could, that the identification of that father is one half of that child's DNA. And it, in this business about the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, forget that. Every family has strengths. We just have to find them. And so, and so what we do with this, what efforts are made to locate and engage extended family members, this is a big issue. And it is a national issue. It's judged in the, in the CFSR process I told you about. They care about this issue. They care about what questions we're asking. So next question, how early in the child protective process is there a meeting involving all parties necessary to discuss the case fully. When does that happen? Anybody? Often prior to filing the petition. Often prior to filing the petition. Often prior to filing the petition. Okay. Anybody else? And what opportunities do family members have to participate in decision making in your child protection system? I understand you call them family team meetings. Yeah, that's the wrong term. Because what you're doing is you're borrowing Annie E. Casey Foundation's team decision making and you re renamed it. Right? Am I right? Because there's another family team meeting that's a different model. And I just want you to know that your name is going to confuse everybody outside of Washington. Okay? You may not care, but I just want to let you know that. Let me tell you what family team meetings are in, uh, in Indiana, in Alabama, in Washington, D.C. I think I've described this later, but I'll do it now. Family team meetings. The social worker, the minute the child is about to be removed, is doing a family finding relative search. So this, this is in a, in a hot case with your 72 hours to going to court or 48 hours or whatever. And before the court hearing, the family, extended family, as much as they can find, is convened with the social worker and anybody else that the family wants to have there, and they devise a plan for that child, which is taken to the court at the initial hearing. That is the family team meeting. In Indiana, they do it in every case. In Alabama, they do it in every case. In Washington, D.C., they do it in some cases. So it combines family finding and team group decision making. But more importantly, for me, my perspective, it involves extended family, not just family. Because often the parents are in the worst position to do anything. So this is, I'll make my principal points right now. Group decision making is better than individuals making decisions, period. It's just better. And engaging family members, you are going to build capacity in the family to take care of the child better in the long run. Because we, the people in this room, are not going to care for children. We are professionals. We have a task to do. We disappear from that family's life. Our job is to build a family in the community and a network of supports so that we can dismiss cases and get on with the next case, the next child, the next family. And in order to do that, we need to engage families. Now, I have written an article on this that talks about six different models, team decision making, family group conferencing, family team meetings, wraparound services, emancipation conferences, court-based mediation. I'm going to show you a court-based mediation film. The idea behind them all is the same. The difference is the amount of time that you take to engage that family and show the family respect, that you listen to them. Remember, 
you will never know that family as well as that family knows itself. You never will. The family has secrets it's not going to tell you about. But the family loves that child. And let's give them a chance to come up with a plan. And these models that I've given you, by the way, all of which have been identified as best practices in other states. And um, the best court-based model is mediation. I'm going to show you a film about that right now. So here we go. This way, by, by coming to mediation, we have a chance to talk about things. We have a chance to make an agreement which would be written up as a contract, which would be enforceable in a court of law. Just take a seat wherever you're comfortable. In the past, most child neglect and abuse cases have been managed by social service departments and adjudicated by the courts with legal counsel representing the interest of all the parties. This adversarial process has not always best served the complex needs of families in crisis. Plus, it takes a great deal of time for courts to sort out cases that do not lend themselves to simple solutions. Some jurisdictions are trying various methods of alternate dispute resolution. One of the most successful of these is mediation. And now what's happened is that mediation has become a part of our court. It wasn't before, it is now. And what I mean by that is that the parties, all of the, the attorneys and the social workers and the judicial officers, we all look upon it as an extension of what we do in the courtroom. And it, we recognize that it can resolve problems that the court cannot resolve. It can resolve those court issues better than the court can resolve them. It can come up with more lasting results, that is, resolutions in which everybody buys into the result. All the professionals are totally overwhelmed with cases. They don't talk to each other unless they're forced to do it, and usually it's five minutes out in the hallway before they go into court. This is an opportunity for everybody involved to hear everything at the same time, to, sh to hear information that some of them have never heard before. Some attorneys from their own clients have never heard what they're hearing in the mediation. It makes all the difference. One of the real advantages of mediation is that the people involved have the opportunity to create a custom solution that the court may not be able to do. The court has a certain list of remedies that it can order, but beyond that it can't go very far. The people at the table, however, have the opportunity to choose any solution that they think. Um, for example, a relative may offer to pay for things or do things that a court wouldn't have them have the authority to order them to do, but they might voluntarily do. What we have found time after time is that people are have been through all attempts at settlement, are set for trial, think they have all the current case information, we walk in the door, begin talking, and they don't. And the information they don't have is the information they need that will help them resolve the case. Um, and our understanding, and my understanding is that um, John Tay has been in a permanent plan for some time, and it's been long-term placement, and there's been a recommendation from the department that that permanent plan change to adoption. And that's, that's got to be one of the most difficult things we could, that a parent would ever have to be faced to have to talk about. But that's our understanding of, of what we're here to discuss. Dependency mediation focuses on fairness, privacy, self-determination, as well as the best interest of all parties, especially the vulnerable children who are the focus of the case. And uh, one thing you did say I agree with 100% is that uh, John Tate do need you in his life, you know, but he's been in my home long enough now that he needs me also and my family, who he's grown up with. 
-hmm. you know, because, I mean, it brings everything into play and because the, she's the young and the short time. And one of the uncertainties. Yeah. I was very skeptical about mediation when it was first proposed. I think the other attorneys in my office were, as well as the attorneys in the other offices associated with the dependency court. It was something that was um, very new. I think as lawyers, there's always a certain sense and fear that maybe you're going to lose some control, and uh, that is something that I think you work very hard to have in a trial process, to be um, able to make the case go the way that you want it to. And in mediation, it doesn't work that way. There were a number of discussions about what format the mediations would take, whether lawyers would even be involved or not, and there are different models for it. A wide variety of mediation models are used in different jurisdictions. Sometimes the mediations are voluntary, other times court-ordered. Sometimes the mediation begins early in a case, when a social service agency calls for mediation at the case planning stage. But it can be called at any time during the life of a case, including the mediation of highly contested situations, such as deciding on termination of parental rights. We don't get the cases that are going to settle somewhere else. We get the cases that are on their way or set for hearing or trial, for the most part. So in mediation, we tend to get the most difficult cases. And even in the most difficult cases, whatever the issue is that's been referred resolves most of the time. Mediations have been used for everything from petty family disputes through the termination of parental rights. Cases frequently include violent domestic abuse, sexual abuse, and other complex matters that once were believed to be beyond the scope of peaceful discussions. Various jurisdictions have developed standards and practices for what types of cases they will refer for mediation, with some selecting only those they feel have the best chance of success. Others send all their contested cases to mediation and are pleased with the high rate of resolution. I asked Steve Barron to come over and naturally I picked four sexual abuse cases, the toughest, most, um, most severe cases that we get. And he resolved in, through a mediation process, usually taking two to three hours, he resolved all four of those cases, this is over a two or three week period, in, a, in one session each. Safety was, of the child was never compromised. The, uh, the ability of the family to talk, the th talk out the problems was, was the, uh, the reason for the success. And all the parties in the process and of course in dependency court there are many parties who are in mediation, came away believing that, my goodness, if we could, if we could safely resolve these issues, well, we can do anything. In, in our program, we picked um, licensed therapists. In other programs, they may be um, uh, attorneys who are experienced with family and juvenile court. They may be ex-child advocates. They may be probation officers. They may be contract mediators or therapists. Our model is we have a male-female co-mediation team, which we think is a real advantage because some clients are more comfortable talking with, with, with uh, men than women. And other clients are more comfortable talking with women than men. And we'll disclose things to uh, a person of a certain gender they won't feel comfortable disclosing to another. And you know, sometimes the hidden agenda is not the issue on the table, not the legal issue. It's the emotional issue. It's they want a sorry, I'm sorry. or. They want to be able to explain why I did something. It, it's, it's, there's so much more psychological and emotional components to this than just the legal issues that are never allowed to be discussed in the, in the courtroom, for instance. If you don't have emotion for some of these issues, like visitation, for an example, enforcing visitation, that doesn't get discussed in front of a judge, but it gets discussed all the time in mediation. Uh, what guarantees do I have that that you know, I'll still visit. You you don't let me visit half the, some of the time. It's so, always so problem. your fear is based on yeah. some past history of visits being canceled. Right. The, the role that, of the that mediator that, that includes that assisting the parties in identifying the issues, fostering joint problem solving, and exploring settlement issues. This neutral third party encourages and facilitates the process without prescribing what the solution should be. The principles of mediation are based on communication, negotiation, facilitation, and problem solving. Mediation focuses on the needs and interests of the participants, fairness, procedural flexibility, 
privacy and confidentiality, full disclosure, and self-determination. A family friend of Gloria's. You know, we had a case recently, I think you probably observed a case, where um, a dad uh, was brought in from jail to participate in mediation. And everybody, I don't know what they thought he wanted, visitation, contact, a family placement, and he realized that wasn't best for the child. But, but the, the kind of setting where people are allowed to talk, to express some feeling, to vent, to be heard, really truly heard and listened to, um, produces change. Gary has suggested that you will be supportive of what seems to be in the best interest of your daughter. Hard as it is for me. Yes, sir. It's all I want is what's best for her. I want her to have a chance to have a good life. To have a good life. Mm -hmm. Depending on the community, participants usually include one or both parents, the minor child, caseworker, attorney for the parent, attorney for the minor, attorney for the Department of Social Service, guardian ad litem, or CASA volunteer, as well as others like kinship care providers, foster parents, or others involved in the case. Sometimes the court enters an order of those who must appear at the mediation, stating any parties or participants who are prohibited from attending the mediation and naming additional participants who may be included by court order or mutual agreement of all parties. Confidentiality relates to the full and open disclosure necessary for the mediation process to be successful. The mediator informs the parties of any limitations on confidentiality, such as mandated reporting of any new allegations of abuse that come out during the mediation session. And one of the problems with, with child welfare is you want to be a social worker and do good things for the family, but you become an adversary as soon as you have to write those negative reports and take the stand and say awful things about the parents. And I think a, a large number of the child welfare workers have realized that there's a lot more social work in mediation than there is in a trial. You know, you never felt like you wanted me to be around. Oh no, I always wish that you would come around more because you know, John Tay, I know he would love to see you when we we're sitting down for Thanksgiving dinner. I know he would love to see you at the table, you know, and I would have loved to see that look in his eyes to see you sitting there. Are you real? So, real? Really? Yes, that's never been a, I always, the door is always open for you to come. You're part of the family just like John Tay is. Another positive that mediation has to offer is that it can clear up some misunderstandings between people. For instance, in dependency, sometimes the foster parents haven't met the parents before. And when they meet at the table, they actually don't, they don't envision a monster anymore. They have a human being in front of them who has feelings. And they can actually relate to each other through the child. Because normally they both love the children or the child. So that's where they connect. And that we are in agreement here that uh, we would try to certify that family friend as a foster family, uh, that we will then move to get an adoption study, is that what you call it? An adoption study is started. That the, uh, if an agreement is reached as to all or part of any matter or issue, including legal or factual issues to be determined by the court, the agreement is immediately reduced to writing, signed by the attending parties, and submitted to the court with copies to all parties and counsel. In many parts of the country, the court is faced with probably three choices. They can accept the agreement as is, they can reject the agreement and either send the parties back to mediation if they had referred them in the first place, or proceed to trial. Um, or lastly, uh, in some areas, the court might seek to change the agreement, but only with the consent of the parties, since it wouldn't be appropriate for the court to change an agreement unless the parties had uh, also agreed to those changes. If they resolved in mediation at that stage, there tended to be a significantly fewer number of contested hearings over the next couple of years. But it saves all the trial time. For instance, the case that was set for a five-day trial settled in three hours of everybody's participation. Just the attorneys, not the courtroom, not the bailiff, not the clerk, settled it there. And that's what happens 70 percent of the time. Which is And I haven't any problem with the plan that you worked out. That's fine. It sounds like a perfect way of uh, handling a very imperfect situation, but mm -hmm. only... When we started mediation, um, 
I think I was telling you downstairs, I was very against it. Um, I, and I think a lot of why I was against it is because I didn't understand it. And I felt like it was taking away um, a big part of what my job was. And so it was very difficult for me to, to buy into the mediation concept. Then I started to find out when I did send things to mediation that the, the solutions that they came back with were very similar to the ones that I managed to kind of get people to buy into, but the real people, the parents, the children, the foster parents, the social workers, they were involved in the process, and so they had a hand in coming up with the solution. And their solutions were every bit as good as mine, and they worked better because they were the ones that solved their own problems. And this was a huge change in the court system here, and it is in any court system. And uh, parents' attorneys in particular are very, very concerned about how mediation is going to affect their clients' rights and how confidentiality is going to work. How can they trust confidentiality when they don't know who these mediators are? Um, so there's, there's a tremendous amount of um, trust building with the, with the players in the court. An important part of, of, of successful implementation of a program is bringing together the key stakeholders, bringing together the uh, agency in that county or state that uh, serves to protect children, bringing together judges and court personnel, bringing together the attorneys that represent the agency for children, guardian ad litem, court appointed special advocates, uh, defense counsel, and others that are involved in child protection, and letting them begin to uh, really shape their own program. Child protection in many ways is very local, and so solutions need to be found within the resources and capabilities and interests in a given community. And I'm going to make an order that she not be removed from the home um, once she's placed. Um, I'm going to make a placement. When parents and child welfare workers and attorneys can come together, knowing more than we could ever know, to figure out a resolution for a particular child, it's more likely to be a good resolution. I mean, there we are, sitting on the bench, dealing with all the rules of evidence and procedure and what you get to hear and what you don't get to hear as a judge, and then we're making a decision that is a life decision for a child. There are many advantages to mediation. Um, one is cost. In most cases, you can settle a case for a fraction of the cost it would take to litigate the matter. We don't have discovery, we don't have you know, a lot of hearings, we don't have a lot of paperwork and so on that is costly. And certainly going to court is costly. If you need witnesses and you have to pay people to be there, it can be extremely costly. Well, the bottom line is mediation in dependency cases saves judicial time, empowers the parties, and fosters better outcomes for the children. That's what it's about. Okay. I haven't got a lot of time for you. This is a project that actually we started in Santa Clara County a long time ago. And it has been exported to almost every model court. So maybe it'll come here. We'll see. Um, adversarial process is bad for families, unhealthy for families. We have a statute in California which says that. And it says, try to work this out outside the courtroom. Uh, this is a tough one, but I want to get it across to you. I believe, and I'm not alone, that what we need to do with children, particularly children who have lost their parents, one way or another. We need to connect them with significant people in their lives. And connection we always think of is relatives, and the statute prefers relatives. But I'm going to suggest to you that important people in your life are not just relatives. They are people that you love, that teach you or you teach, that share your blood, that's relatives, and your, to whom your soul is connected. Heart, mind, body, and soul, okay? Red for the heart, green, that's not a very good green. Green for the fertile and creative mind, blue for the blood, and yellow for the light of the soul. And that we should start using a medical model like the genogram, 
and all you medically trained people know what I'm talking about, for all of our families. We should have every child, we should have one of these, every adult. And what does this do? This tells you who this child is connected to. It tells you who you are going to look for when you try to get people together to talk about this child's future. It's very easy to, to create because you're talking, you're interviewing, and you're finding out what really matters to this child or this adult. And here we have, real quickly, a 16-year-old girl with four girlfriends, 20-year-old boyfriend, who doesn't have a red line. Red members love. Doesn't have a red line to, to many people, just a, an uncle, an aunt, and a foster grandmother and a music teacher. Well, if this child loves those people, then those people are important in that child's life, and we ought to have them at the table or try to make them a part of the network which we're building. Remember, what we're doing is we're building families in child welfare law. Families that have not been successful, we are trying to organize and build them, and this is a very useful tool for that. And this is the timeliness chart. I have a whole separate lecture on this. I have a law review article on this that I, I write for judges, and this is how early do you get going in your system? Are your attorneys appointed before the first hearing? Do they meet before the first hearing? Do you have settlement talks before the first hearing? That's a test of every system in the country. When you visit, and I in, encourage you as part of your model court to visit Utah, to visit Santa Clara County, to visit uh, Hamilton County, uh, Ohio, courts that have really moved forward in all the areas I've been talking about. Because court systems are slow. You lawyers, you went to law school as I did. And for three years, we learned all the tricks of how to get cases continued. That, that's our great art. And I'm telling you now, we got to cut it out. We got to all work harder. Time is of the essence. As we all know, kids can't wait. And a dependency system that front loads, that intensively works early, is going to pay off later in faster results, better results for the kid and for the family. We know where we're headed because we, our best practices, we've picked them up around the country now. We've got better innovations that we had 10 years ago, and I'm, I'm not sure there's much more we're going to learn. And, and I think philosophically that we remove too many children. I just think that we've, if you compare us to the rest of Europe and the other so-called industrialized world, we, we remove too many kids. And the reason we don't do better is I think it's at the front end. I think we need to make those decisions. We, put, we need to put intensive work in. When you invite Jim Payne out here, who runs social services in Indiana and used to be a juvenile court judge for 20 years, he talks about 30, 30, 30, the first 30 minutes, the first 30 days, and the first 30 hours. I got those mixed up. About what they do during that emergency time up front. That's it. Thank you. Thank you.